Like all of you who are over about 45, and I think the lucky ones of you who are under 45, but by some miracle slipped through the net of, of repression, I was a free-range child. When I was a child, the word cotton wool kids had not been invented. There was no need for it. I came from a housing estate on the edge of London. My mother was a single parent. Uh, my mother and grandmother, who brought me up, were, were almost... Um, indecently over-careful for those days, now they would probably have the social workers round. Because, of course, from the age of seven or eight, they let me out. This is what we did. And when I think about today's generation, I get sad, and then I get very angry, and then I get very, very determined to do something about it. Last year, I was asked to write... Um, for Daniel, really. <laughs> I was asked to write this, the Natural Childhood Report for the National Trust, and it was such a privilege to do this because basically what it involved was gathering together all the evidence, some of it probably gathered by people like you in the first place and your organisations you work for, and putting it together to try to identify what the issues were, what the barriers were, and what the potential solutions were. And it was a great joy to do. And you know, the findings will not surprise you. The findings, if you haven't read it, and please do, were that there are many, many barriers, some of them very real. When I was 14, my mother let me cycle to the New Forest and spend a week camping there with my friend and then come back. Don't think she'd have done that today. Because traffic, I would have been run over within about 100 yards of leaving. Of course, the fear of stranger danger, that terrible barrier, and yet again, and I think Chris Baines is joining us tonight, Chris Baines said every time there is a story, these tragic, terrible stories like Madeleine McCann or April Jones, it's another nail in the coffin for children's freedom. No matter that the man who kidnapped April Jones allegedly is a relative of hers, you know, the fact that that's irrelevant. She was out playing, she was out doing what every kid should do, and she was kidnapped. The reason I know her name and you know her name is that, of course, it's so unbelievably rare that these things happen. But what has happened, and what we found <coughs> with the report, is that we've ended up with this terrible, terrible fear. And that a new phrase, helicopter parents who hover over their children and not only won't let them do anything, but actually then force them to do loads of things that are probably very exciting for them, but never involve them being bored, never involve them being outdoors, having that moment where you go, oh, what do I do now? Oh, there's a tree. I know, I'll climb it. You know, that's the basics of what this is about. It's, it's getting children out of doors. I and many of you have had a career, a lifetime in nature, and that's a wonderful thing. Most of my contemporaries, most of my friends who I still see, who I grew up with and did all these things with, they didn't become naturalists or, or wildlife TV producers, but they do still have a connection with the natural world, and that is what, as I say, is missing today. And I fear terribly that the only people who will become naturalists in the future are the children of naturalists. So my kids will be fine, because we live in Somerset and we've got a big garden and they can go out and I'm showing them stuff. But all my contemporaries in the RSPB, people like Andy, you know, many people here, our parents mostly weren't very into it, actually. You know, it wasn't something that ran in the family. So we're excluding vast numbers of people who really should be out doing it. Um, the final question I was asked to, to touch on um, was, what can we do? How do we tackle the challenge? Now, when I was writing the report, I had this terrible moment where I try, kept trying to write out with bullet points and tables all the things we could do. And it suddenly dawned on me that why, who was I to suggest what we should do? So, thank goodness, Daniel and his colleagues at the National Trust agreed with me, and they threw it out to people like you, some of the people I've seen today in the audience um, were involved in this, and they produced this, which is the response to the report. It's absolutely brilliant. I had nothing to do with it, so I can say that, because what it does is it takes... It, they went and spoke to experts, they went and spoke to organisations, but most of all they asked ordinary mums and dads, members of the public and children to respond and they got some very, very interesting findings. Now what these confirm is that, as Andy said, we are in a massive crisis. But unlike every other massive crisis like climate change or the economy, everyone 
agrees that we should do something, doesn't matter what political party, what newspaper, you know, journalists, politicians, health workers, teachers, conservationists, parents, grandparents, we all think something should be done. The big question <laughs> is what? That's actually Andy's job. He's now, <laughs> over the next few years, got to coordinate, working with the National Trust, the RSPB, and everyone else, what we can actually put into practice. And there are so many things, because what we know, and what came very much from this research, is there's obviously no magic bullet. There's no one thing that we could do, although if I was asked what would make the most difference, changing the law so that in every residential street in Britain, if you are driving down it and you hit anyone, child, pedestrian, dog, adult, it's your fault. No matter what the child was doing. If the child was racing out of a shop having stolen something and you hit them, it's your fault. If you could change that and you could get children playing out in the street, when children play out in the street, and again we're back to jumpers for goalposts, they go, what's that over there? Because they have a horizon and they think, I know, I'll go and have a look. Sometimes they get into trouble doing that. In fact, nowadays they nearly always get into trouble. But that's what we need. We need to start by simply getting children out of doors, basically doing nothing. And however many wonderful things we do that are organised activities, however many brilliant television programmes we make, however many events we hold, that won't do it. Ultimately, we have to find a way, and this is why it's so difficult, to change our entire way of thinking so that children playing outdoors and engaging with nature on their doorstep is normal. Sounds really revolutionary, doesn't it? <laughs> you think, how bizarre, children playing outdoors. Well, you know, that's what it used to be like. And we really can make it like that again. So I want you all, and I'm sure you're doing this already, to become what I think I've become over the last few years, you become an evangelist for nature. My colleague Tim Schoons once said, he said, you're like one of those American born-again Christian preachers. Have you heard the good news about the natural world? Well, yeah. You know, as Wendy said earlier, it was very, I found it very moving when she said this. She said, I've had such a wonderful life engaged with nature because as a child, I got the bug. I imagine that applies to every single one of us in this room. So let's not deny it to this generation, the next generation, the past generation, and their families. Thank you. <laughs>